Now, um, then second announcement. This tutorial is slightly different than the ones uh, we used to give. Uh, beforehand, if you come to a tutorial about image processing and Mathematica, it was basically Mathematica that I would talk about and uh, all the great features of Mathematica and explain what we have, show the scope and so forth. Now, we noticed that there are quite a few Mathematica users out there uh, who love to do a little bit of image processing but don't have any background on image processing. So this talk is slightly different. It, doesn't, it assumes to a certain degree that you know Mathematica and I now just like to show you how you do math, uh, image processing, what kind of tools you have, what's possible, and where things get difficult. Because the standard uh, experience is that you get started and you think it's easy, and then very quickly find out that things don't work the, the way you anticipate they should work. Uh, and unfortunately, you're working with real data, and real data never comes the way, uh, theoretically, it should be. And uh, so, uh, I just tried to show you a few things to get going on that track. This is a kind of a test run for a larger kind of workshop because I only have one hour and one hour is way too short to get anything really done. So uh, bear with me, I'm gonna jump across and this is just a very small excerpt of what will be a larger tutorial. The next one will be in Amsterdam uh, on the 17th and 18th of June and then we'll have a webinar version and eventually we have a big webinar version of this uh, out on the web. All right, uh, well, that was abstract. We'll just skip this. Uh, quickly, an overview. Uh, I will follow somewhat the classical path into uh, image processing. That would basically be first some basics. What is the object that represents an image and so forth? Then I'll be talking about filtering, regularizing images, uh, getting rid of the noise in an image and so forth. And then the first big topic is segmentation, how to identify parts in an image. Uh, then once you have done that, the next uh, natural step would be morphology, how to uh, twist or how to get what you found in the right shape or measure, make measurements on it. Uh, and then last but not least, I'll talk about registration uh, in case it doesn't ring a bell. Registration is the art in image processing, processing of having two images and trying to get them congruently on top of each other. So if you have, uh, let's say, a PET scan and an MRI scan in medicine, you may have the same object and then you try to get the data on top of each other. Or if you have uh, two photographs and you would like to make a big scenery that's called stitching, you have to get the overlap of those two images and uh, make them fit. All right, um, so let's not waste any time. Five minutes into the hour. Um, First, some basics. Now, if you use Mathematica, um, you probably forgot some of the computer basics, which is what data type are you using and so forth, because you don't have to worry about it anymore. That's not quite true in uh, image processing, because images are really uh, stored in just uh, a one byte per pixel or a bit 16 uh, implementation and so forth. So I will spend a little bit, the first five to 10 minutes, on some basics about the uh, image implementation in Mathematica, which may be boring, but uh, it will turn out to be essential once you do some work in Mathematica. Okay, first of all, trivial thing, anything you create in Mathematica, be it an array, 2D, 3D, you can convert into an image by simply plugging it into the image object, which is also its own creator. So you just have, let's say, in this case, um, an image potentially with three channels. Uh, you define a color space, and just by typing this into Mathematica, you create an image, hopefully, and this, you know, this little speck there at the very bottom, uh, uh, that's now your two times three pixel image. Now that's one way to create or import images. Another way, of course, is to just tap into the uh, example database in Mathematica to uh, generate images if you don't have one at hand. For example, if you don't have a, a 3D volume, uh, which I may not get now because, let's see, am I connected? I may have to go. Uh, let me try once again because I'm working, I think, on a development version and for development, oh, there we go, okay. Uh, I have to have VPN access. Uh, okay, so this would give you then a sample object, uh, in this case a 3D object, uh, which is also considered an image from my perspective. Uh, which you can nicely view, you can rotate, you can change all kinds of aspects of the visualization of this, which I'll skip right now. And then last but not least, you can get uh, data from anywhere, uh, from local files, from remote files. So if I would basically here tap on the web page for this conference, 
I would be able to get a conference image just like that into Mathematica. So it's no big deal to get the images in. And once you have the images in, you can work on them. You can ask for all kinds of properties, um, like image dimension of the volume I just had. It's a 256 times 256 times 110 uh, voxel volume. Uh, you can ask about how many image channels that one image I had. I was generating three images, uh, three channels. Then the color space you have. And then if you want to be more precise, you can even uh, uh, extract the uh, so-called color profile for an image, uh, which is a bit more specific on how the color is encoded. I mean, the image in internally is just a set of numbers, and then you have to have a translation on how that number is uh, displayed as a color. And that can be device-dependent, uh, and for all these device-dependent uh, uh, color uh, spaces, you have color data, a profile data, and they usually come with the image, otherwise you can generate them in Mathematica. Uh, usually a volume has just one channel, basically encoding, having a kind of an index encoding, which means uh, you have to translate just one number into a corresponding color, and the corresponding command for uh, 2D images would be colorize. You can just say here I have a image which initially is grayscale because it just has values between 0 and 255 per pixel. And I can just say, oh, translate that please via color function into, let's say, this kind of U construct. Uh, and then you get a different coloring of that image. And the same holds true, of course, for 3D volumes. But there, there's one additional uh, feature, and that is you not only specify the color, but also the opacity, the translucence, the transparency of that voxel. And that makes it uh, clear if you can look through that voxel or not, which is essential for 3D. And uh, what you then specify is called a transfer function, or in mathematical terms, it's a color function. And here you can specify, for example, via blend, a color function that says, well, if you come in with zero, you basically have a completely transparent uh, voxel. A voxel with a value of 0 0.03 uh, is less transparent, has a little bit of reddish in there. And here you get more and more opaque colors until you hit orange, and that eventually will render now the uh, previous volume here in a more rusty color, so it's a rusty engine uh, on a uh, greenish background. And last but not least, uh, images tend to come with all kinds of extra information that you could also utilize in Mathematica. This one was taken from the last conference in, uh, in London, where we had a spectacular view from the Canary Wharf uh, onto the city of London, and I uh, took this image, and here you can see that I used my little iPad for getting that image. Uh, you can see the time when I took the image, uh, all kinds of additional information that may be useful generating uh, that particular uh, image and uh, maybe processing it later on. You can extract the time and so forth. All right, so that's how, how much I'd like to talk about generating or getting images into Mathematica. The first um, property worthwhile mentioning is that uh, images also tend to come, but not always, may have an alpha channel, which is just an extra channel that uh, specifies the transparency of a voxel. And that's quite often used if you compose images, if you extract images, and so forth. Um, so I quickly do that. This is an initial image of our planet, and I'll look if it has an alpha channel. Well, by image measurement, I can, by the way, extract all kinds of global properties of an image. And, uh, um, and uh, well, in this case, I don't have an alpha channel, but I can, for example, re extract the background, which, by the way, is already a segmentation command, remove background, and uh, which, uh, well, it's very promising, of course, it not always works, but in many cases it does work uh, just by itself automatically, and it extracts the background from whatever image you have based on color at the rim or on the factor of blurness and so forth. Uh, and then I can put that background uh, part uh, partition or segmentation back into the image. Um, oh, no, sorry, it is encoded here now via uh, an alpha channel, so the background seems to be gone, but actually it's not gone, it's just transparent, and you can extract it by extracting the alpha channel here, and you see foreground is white, background is black. Or uh, we also use then the transparency is if you compose images, then of course the image that goes in front has to be transparent where it, uh, it's not supposed to show, and this is now possible with an alpha channel in image compose. All right, some uh, basics. Uh, this one I just skipped because we do have limited time. Uh, this is about how data is arranged, uh, interleaving or not interleaving in an image, um, how the channels are arranged in, in the memory. Um, that's usually not 
of any concern unless you really extract the data. Uh, what's more of a concern is now, as I mentioned up front, is the image type, by which I mean the data type used to encode the image. Uh, something that we don't con are not concerned in Mathematica anymore, but we have to be concerned when we deal with uh, images. For example, if you usually load in an image, uh, in probably 99% of the cases, it's uh, of a byte type, which means you have one byte per pixel and color channel because that is fairly compact, it doesn't waste too much uh, memory, it's not like uh, encoding things with a, a mathematical integer where you would just burn eight bytes right away. And while you have other ways, you can have a, a bit encoding, which means just uh, one bit per pixel, uh, which is not quite true, the actual encoding is one byte, you have byte encodings. Uh, bit 16, which would be two byte per pixel and for a channel, or you have then a floating point encodings, which would be real 32 or real 64. Now, I just mentioned that because it does have implications um, when you do arithmetic with your images. And uh, they may be quite a surprising, and if you're not aware of the image type, it's one of those things where you just go up the wall. Um, let's say I have an image, the image that I loaded there, uh, Lena, which is the standard image, I think, in image processing, a Playboy girl from I don't know how many years ago. Uh, if I add now, let's say 0.5, which would be half the brightness of the image, and I subtract it again, arithmetically, mathematically, this is a, an operation that, that amounts to nothing. Uh, but if you do it in image processing, you see the image is now uh, has less contrast, it's uh, dull. Well, what happened is uh, you add 0.5 to all the values, and all the values in Mathematica are always scaled uh, for operational purposes between 0 and 1. 1 is complete brightness or white, 0 is black per channel or color. And uh, if I add now 0.5, it means that all the bright colors, the 50%, the top 50% got uh, extended to 1 to 1.5 and got clipped. And then if I subtract again 0.5, uh, the clipping I cannot undo uh, because I only have one byte per uh, voxel and then I'm screwed. I can even make this more uh, uh, extreme by let's say taking another command and there you see you have an even uh, larger effect. And you can overcome this very quickly if you do let's say uh, arithmetic or diffusion operations and so on that's automatically done internally. You can convert the data type of an image just by wrapping image and then a different data specification around the image itself and convert it in this case to floating point, which would be a 32-bit uh, floating point encoding or per pixel. And then you can do any of this and uh, no clipping occurs and you're fine again. So this is just uh, some background information and uh, some commands like blur, they do not change the image type where other commands like Gaussian filter uh, does. So uh, one has to be aware of that. It's not dramatic, but if you don't get the results you anticipate, this is most likely one of the uh, reasons why. All right, then uh, last basic topic, uh, then we get more interesting stuff, um, are image coordinates. Uh, and this is um, a very ugly issue in image processing because there are different coordinate systems floating around, and that can be very, very confusing. And the reason for that is First, you can see an image like a discrete array of pixel values, and if you see it as an array or a matrix, the natural way to specify uh, a coordinate or a pixel would be by row and column. And this would uh, amount then to what I call a matrix or index coordinate system, basically, which goes as follows. You first specify uh, the row, which basically goes from top to bottom, uh, in this case from 1 to H, uh, from uh, pixel 1 to uh, pixel H, uh, H standing for the height of the image. And then the second coordinate is the column coordinate going from 1 to W. Uh, so straightforward. And whenever you have a mathematical command that works on arrays as well as on images, this is most likely the coordinate system that command refers to. So if you, for, extract, for example, extract something, or let's say with a Gaussian filter which works on arrays and images, you basically have here as a third argument a way to specify in which direction you take a derivative of the Gaussian, uh, Gaussian kernel. And this is not in X and Y coordinates because it also works on arrays, but in row and column. So the first one is the row index, so I say now I take a, uh, a derivative in the row coordinate, and not only is that x and y flipped now, it's also y goes in the opposite direction, so it's really confusing. So basically, this amounts to a, a derivative in minus y. Um, 
And as you can see here, uh, I have your bright spot and I go up the bright response here on the top and I go down again here at the bottom. So I go from top to bottom. Uh, whereas the second argument is now the column uh, uh, or the positive x direction as I go from left to right. And if I would take this as Cartesian coordinates, I would assume this to be the first coordinate and the second one plus a minus sign or times a minus sign would be the second argument. But it's the other way around. But to make matters worth, uh, worse, um, we also have the graphics or the image coordinate system and that is applicable whenever you see an image as a continuous function, like a luminosity function. And any functions nowadays you assume to be in a Cartesian coordinate system where you don't have your origin on the top left, but at the bottom left, and you first have a coordinates going from left to right, the x1, and the one from bottom up to top, which is the y coordinate. And uh, this always applies in Mathematica when you have uh, uh, commands that are solely working on graphics or image objects. Um, and, uh, well, two worlds, and sometimes you have to go from one to the other or vice versa. And it's not our fault, it's the way uh, the world has been, Mathematica has been, and we would have loved to get away from this, but uh, it got in there nevertheless. Uh, so if you, for example, recall an image value, then that is done in xy coordinates uh, like this here. All right, and also if you have like commands like image lines, uh, which extracts straight lines from an image, the coordinates you get out there are now the xy or Cartesian coordinates that you also can readily apply into the graphics object in Mathematica. So here I first run a gradient filter on the image so I get the edges as a strong marker. Then from that I extract image lines. From that I get the coordinates where the lines hit the boundary of the image. And then I use these lines to put into a line object here in a graphics object and uh, um, display it on top of the image and, uh, oh, I should first execute this one here, and then this one here, and then it deploys all the straight lines on the image. Okay, so this is all the basic stuff. 15 bit, more than 15 minutes gone, and now we actually address real image processing, and uh, I'll start with a very simple filters to begin with, with filters that basically just take one pixel or look at one pixel in an image and do something to that one single pixel uh, and substitute it by a new value. So a point-wise filter, so to say. And um, you may say, well, they're pretty boring or uh, dull, but uh, they are not. I'll show you a very nice example in a second. Um, basically, these are filters that are concerned with not the uh, range of pixels, but with the range of color. Um, and so my first command here is a very simple one. It's color negate. You basically take every channel value and subtract it from, minus, uh, from one. So you take basically the negative uh, color and uh, this is like a color negative of that particular image. Uh, and uh, there's one command in Mathematica with which you can build any kind of point-wise filter and it's called image apply. Image apply takes a function as first argument that is then being applied to every pixel at a time and this would result in the very same object. And uh, here are some other uh, Another collection of built-in pixel-wise filters like uh, conversion to grayscale, color negation we had already had, thresholding, so converting to binarize or bitmap, uh, uh, bit images, or here a brightening or darkening uh, filters. Or you can build, as I said, your own filters. This one looks at the color. Uh, it makes sure that the red and green, if that's always bigger than two times the blue channel, it uh, keeps the color, otherwise it converts it to grayscale. Uh, and this, was, for example, does this to the, to the image, uh, basically making the background of that particular image uh, uh, grayish instead of bluish. So you can create all kinds of very nice filter effects with that particular function. And last but not least, I quickly like to mention image adjust because whenever you do something to an image, you take derivatives and so on, it's sometimes you don't end up in the typical uh, color range between zero and one. And in order to readjust that so that you actually see something instead of something black or something co completely white, image adjust always brings it back to that uh, number range, zero and one. And not only that, you can specify certain parameters if you want to, and the most important one, I think, is the gamma one, because usually uh, the, the number value per pixel and the color intensity does not have a linear relation. It depends on the uh, device you're looking at. Uh, usually it goes with an exponent, exponent up to the exponent gamma, 
And if you do any linear operations and you want to have a linear relation between your color and your uh, uh, numbers, you have to make sure that uh, the encoding of your image has an exponent of gamma one. Otherwise, you have these over, uh, high contrast or low contrast images. Um, all right, so now one step uh, more difficult. We now look at more interesting, oh no, these were point-wise, oh no, still point-wise filters, sorry. So we're still looking at filters that just take one pixel and do something with that pixel. And uh, a bit more uh, a mundane example here is now uh, what I, what's called histogram equilibrization. Basically, if you have an image like this, uh, this one here, and uh, you look at the image histogram, you see the distribution in color. So uh, for every channel here, for the red, blue, and green channel, uh, I see the distribution, and I see it's not even, but I, uh, sometimes it's very uh, evenly distributed, sometimes it's very uh, uh, pointy. And uh, in order to maximize, of course, the, uh, uh, the uh, contrast in the image, uh, it would be nice to have a completely constant or equal uh, uh, histogram distribution. It may not be always appealing, not what you want, but that's something we're going for right now. And uh, so I'll just show you the steps now you would do in Mathematica to perform a um, histogram equilibrization. Um, so basically, first of all, I separate now uh, the three color channels, uh, red, green, and blue, into three grayscale uh, images. And then I um, basically ask here for a histogram transform interpolation per channel. And this gives me uh, interpolating functions that transfer, uh, transform the color values in each of the channels in such a way that the distribution of uh, uh, colors will be even. And uh, I quickly apply that. Oh, so basically show these transformations so you sh uh, uh, see it's not linear anymore, but it's here I had a peak in blue, so I have to stretch the values in blue by having a steep mapping function. So when, if I have a value of 0.2 in the blue channel, it spits out a value of a bit more than 0.4, for example. And I apply these functions now to all the color channels, and then, uh, well, I'll do that by math thread to all the channels, and then color combine them, and you see I get here now, as a result, a uh, much intenser color, intense, uh, an image with a higher color intensity compared to this one. It may not be the right thing to do, but uh, nevertheless, I think you got the idea, and you can also verify that now the histogram, the color histogram, is almost flat in all three channels. Of course, you do have little changes because the whole thing is discretized, and uh, because of the discretized range of colors, uh, you have these uh, slight variations in, uh, in the histogram. And of course, all of this can also be done in just one step. In Mathematica, the command would have been a histogram transform, but just showing that would have been a little bit boring, I guess. And while you can vary, uh, vary this concept, for example, you can uh, color separate here this autumn, uh, uh, these autumn leaves here via uh, color separate into uh, color space H, S, B, U, saturation, brightness, and then just uh, uh, apply the histogram transform not to all color channels, but just to the saturation colors channels, and that way you generate uh, here an image where the color, uh, the fall colors, the autumn colors, are much brighter, and usually the way you also perceive them with, with your eye uh, into uh, Mathematica. Or you can do another gimmick. Uh, here I have two images. One, uh, I don't know, I forgot which church that is somewhere in France or in the uh, Benelux countries, a church that was painted by Van Gogh. So this is the painting by Van Gogh, and you know Van Gogh had very intense colors or a very uh, unusual way to perceive uh, uh, reality. And if you want to get that uh, um, distribution of colors onto this photograph, you basically do a histogram transform, but not to a flat histogram, but you basically take this as the target histogram distribution. And that way you end up with this photograph, which is now the way Van Gogh saw that particular church. So it's like a very nice little gimmick. All right, so much for pixel-wise filters. Now I go one step uh, further and look at filters that not just look at a single pixel, but at the vicinity, at the neighborhood of pixels, thereby also taking spatial relations in the image into account. So far, we did not take any spatial relations into account, so the image could have been, until now, just a long list of numbers. Uh, the array structure, the neighborhood structure was of no concern. This is different now, and I'll just uh, show you a few filters. 
um, uh, and how to play with it. Let's say the filter is phi. It basically takes all these neighborhood pixels. Usually, it's a rectangular area uh, where the radius specifies. Uh, uh, yeah, this would be a radius one uh, neighborhood, basically taking the pixel plus uh, uh, all the first neighbors into account. If you have a radius two neighborhood, you would take uh, all the extra pixels around here, five times five neighborhood, and so forth. Uh, taking all these nine numbers into account, throwing into them into a one function, and then the function spits out a new color value or whatever. Uh, so this would be a, a local um, filter, and uh, let's apply this to a, an example in medicine. If you have the retinal fundus in the back of your eye and you want to segment the uh, veins, the uh, blood vessels, for example, you can already do that readily like this, but you will find out doing so you run into all kinds of uh, issues. For example, the fovea is also black, so just doing, let's say, a binarization, a thresholding will not work. You have your bright features. But the features you're looking at here have a certain scale. So what you can do is apply filters like max filter or minimum filter, which just take the maximum pixel value or the minimum pixel value in a certain area, and apply that in uh, uh, one after the other. And uh, by doing that, you already get rid of all the black lines simply because if I apply the max filter with a certain radius, uh, if the lines are very thin, no matter where I am, it, I will always somewhat get a pixel from the background, from the brighter background, and fill it in. So this basically generates a kind of a background without the veins, which is pretty neat. And then uh, to get rid of some noise, I may want to blur uh, uh, the whole, uh, uh, the whole uh, process a little bit to have it more even, an even background. Uh, this, by the way, closing is just another word for uh, uh, the combination of min, max and min filter here. And then last but not least, I subtract that background that I just had there from the image and thereby I get a very crisp representation of all the veins. And this would be a typical example, kind of a pre-processing approach if you have a problem getting rid of all the stuff you don't want. Um, and uh, this you usually do with these kind of filters and you can, can change the radius and see what the radius of the filter has, uh, what kind of effect it has. If it's too small, you obstruct large veins. If it's uh, too large, you get too many of the other de detail into the image and manipulate in Mathematica as a nice way to play around and uh, see uh, what effect or what parameter would have. All right. Um, now, there are so many filters out there. Uh, I think I just got the concept across. Uh, you, um, uh, you can just look uh, at the documentation in Mathematica and see what, uh, what's out there. I just um, want to bring up quickly one class of filters which are heavily used in image processing, and these are re regularization filters based on a Gaussian or some kind of distribution, uh, which you usually apply as a kernel, a convolution kernel, onto the image. And by, for example, taking derivatives of that kernel, you also can take derivatives of the image. You usually don't do pointwise derivatives in an image, but you, uh, um, you basically apply the derivative on the kernel in the convolution, which, strictly speaking, is the same as applying the kernel on the derivative of the function. That's the uh, convolution theorem. If you have two functions, you convolve f and g. Then f prime uh, convolved with g is the same as f convolved with G prime. So um, essentially, if I apply this kernel, I take the derivative of an image uh, plus some blurring. And uh, since you cannot do without some blurring uh, in image processing, because otherwise you increase the uh, noise in an image uh, dramatically, uh, taking derivatives and uh, these things always come at a certain scale or uh, filter radius. And uh, I'll just show you a few examples here. Uh, now explicitly, I, via image convolve, I apply this Gaussian matrix in X and Y, and you can see that I take uh, your kind of derivatives of the previous image, and by taking now X, uh, the derivative X, uh, derivative squared in X plus a derivative squared in Y, the square root of that, I um, can generate here a kind of a gradient filter, which of course is built in, uh, just trying to show the concept of all these built-in filters. And uh, this can go a long way. You can extract all kinds of features that way. And just to give you an idea, I quickly mention here without going into detail, the corner filter. The corner filter basically uh, takes derivatives at every pixel and then groups these derivatives into this matrix, which is called the structure matrix. Um, and then if you take, um, it's not the Hessian, so it's not the second derivative of x uh, and, and so on, but it's the first derivative. And then you take a product uh, here. 
And uh, you can take this uh, matrix and then uh, calculate the eigenvalues. And if both eigenvalues are large, you uh, basically have a gradient in both directions, and then you have a corner. So this is a great corner detector, uh, by, first invented by Shito Masi. And uh, there are other corner detectors out there. We also have them implemented. But uh, here, readily use in Mathematica the command corner filter, and it would automatically uh, generate now bright spots wherever there is a corner in the image. You can, have, you can create junction, T-junction filters, uh, all kinds of filters with, uh, in that way. And uh, last but not least here at this point, I'd like to point out image adjust again, because if you don't apply this, the response, numerical response, may be too low, and uh, you may see, ah, it's not working, it's broken, but it's not true, it's just that the uh, range of values happens to be uh, such that uh, it's all black, and to bring it back into the range between zero and one, Image adjust is a very convenient command to have. All right, um, so I have shown you now all kinds of uh, tools that I have, so it's about time to come up with the first simple application to uh, give the whole talk uh, some meat, some uh, satisfaction that you actually can get somewhere with uh, the tools I just introduced. And uh, what I now want to build quickly is a little routine that automatically, with uh, pictures like this, tries to find out what's the vertical in that image and tries to rotate the image so it doesn't, uh, 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 it looks, that it looks upright. So I have here an image of St. Paul Cathedral in London and uh, it's, it's a non-trivial uh, um, perspective. So you don't see a horizon necessarily, so you cannot take just the horizon and move, uh, get that uh, horizontal. Uh, it's a bit more tricky than that. So uh, in order to make this automated, I'll do the following. I'll try to identify the major lines in this uh, uh, image, and those that are somewhat vertical, I assume to be, uh, that they should be vertical, because usually vertical lines then uh, should all meet, if they are somewhat parallel, somewhere uh, at infinity, right beneath the center of the image. If that's the case, uh, then you, the whole structure is upright. If not, um, uh, you have probably some rotation in there. <coughs> so. And I'll quickly go through the steps in Mathematica, uh, looking for these uh, uh, criteria, and then I assemble that into a little routine. So first step would be, whoops, okay, first of all I have to change the image. Uh, first step would be to get the edges in the image, uh, and I'll just do this with the uh, gradient filter I just introduced. Uh, I do that at scale one, I could, depending on what image I have, I also could uh, look at a different scale, uh, but uh, for this purpose one is fine. Then I do what's called a radon transform. Now a radon transform, uh, you may not know, but you probably know where it's being used, and that's in tomography. Uh, tomography at, uh, at an MRI scan or uh, X-ray, uh, X, uh, uh, X, well, yeah, tomography in general, you usually have an inverse radon transform. Basically you have uh, rays coming from all sides, describing straight lines, and you know how they're absorbed or not absorbed. And if knowing uh, how the image looks like, uh, having uh, accumulated all the projections in one line, you try to reconstruct the image itself. And that's called an inverse radon transform. Now we do the opposite. We basically look how the image decomposes into straight lines. And that is done the following way. You basically project straight lines on that image in all positions, all directions, and see how much white pixels you uh, accumulate under these lines. And if you take the line distance from the center in the vertical axis and the orientation or the slope of the line in the uh, horizontal axis, that's the response you get back. I can also interactively show this because this is not that easily explained. Here I have a manipulate and you see here the corresponding line and here down here you see the corresponding point in the radon transform. And what I can change here with the line is the distance from the center and the tilt. So you see with the tilt, I move the point left and right. With the D, I move it up and down. And if, for example, I have a strong edge, the edge, let's say, here on the right-hand side at the building, uh, this way, a bit further to the side, come on. Here, you see I have a strong response, and you also see there is a strong response in the radon transform. And if I just look for the peaks in the radon transform, I basically find major straight lines in an image. And that's exactly what the uh, image lines command does, really. It looks for peaks 
distinct peaks in the radon transform and thereby it gets the, uh, the position and uh, the slope and position of the straight lines. And uh, that's exactly what's being done here. So by just uh, calling image lines, I intrinsically do a radon transform and do this peak detection. And thereby I get here these major lines in that photography. I don't ask for all possible peaks that I can get here just for the major uh, the 12 or whatever uh, major lines that I find. And now I see that I have a few straight lines here, one, two, three, four, and five, and eventually they should meet either under the image if I'm looking down or um, they should be above the image uh, if I'm looking up. And so what I need, I need a little uh, routine that uh, first of all converts these, the coordinates I get here from an origin on the left bottom, uh, on the left bottom corner to the center of the image because I have to relate everything to the center of the image eventually. So it's just a, a movement of origin. And here I have a command which calculates the line intersection of all these parallel lines or semi-parallel lines. Um, and then I apply these. That gives me then the intersections of every line with every other line. And then I look for these intersections that are somewhat above the image in a certain area and a little bit away from the image, so that they are somewhat at infinity. So I look here at uh, the directions of these intersections and uh, I just look at those that are somewhat 60 to 120 degrees up there, uh, 90 degrees being the vertical. And then I find that all these uh, intersecting points are roughly in a direction of 84, 87, 88 degrees. And uh, taking into account that I will have, of course, some uh, uh, flaws in measurement, I'll just take the mean, uh, sorry, the median of uh, this uh, selection of uh, angles that I have there. And based on that, I find that they have a tilt of about three degrees. I apply that while image rotate, and here the image is upside straightened out. And uh, well, that was too much uh, of uh, work. You can just collect all of this, let's say, into a command called vertical alignment. It does that automatically now, just calling it up, and then you can eventually do something useful. Take the leading power of Pisa and uh, <laughs> automatically straighten it up. So this would have been a, a kind of a simple, nice little um, uh, segmentation. Okay, uh, given time, I think I'm going to skip this, uh, maybe just mentioning what you may want to look up uh, if you get the uh, hands on this notebook. Um, if you get started with images, usually images don't have clean data. data uh, the data always comes with some kind of noise. And depending on what noise you have, uh, well, first of all, not, not every noise is created equal. So uh, some images may have a Gaussian noise, a Laplacian noise, a Poisson noise. For example, images in uh, low light conditions have a Poisson noise because you just have a few light quanta reaching the, uh, uh, the uh, sensitive um, uh, part of your camera. And uh, depending on what you have, you have to apply different filters. Uh, and this is just some theory of what kind of noise is out there. So you can, for example, have salt and pepper noise, which is typical if, uh, oops, sorry, uh, if some of your pixels are broken, you can have a Gaussian noise, you can have Poisson noise. And then depending on what you have, you can apply different filters. And here I'm just looking at a one family of filters. These are called total variation filters. And these are so-called global filters, not local filters anymore, because they try to optimize an image under a functional. And a functional basically is nothing else but a function that not only takes values, but a whole function. The function now in this case being the image itself. Let's assume the image itself, uh, the function is called f, that's the input. And you try to find another function, which is your output image, u. And that combination of f and u should uh, um, maximize or minimize this kind of, in this case, minimize this kind of functional. It tries to get the uh, best possible value out of this uh, construct. And the construct reads as follows. First of all, you try to make sure that uh, the so-called total variation of your image, u, is as low as possible. That means pixel values don't tend to go up and down. Derivatives in that image tend to be low unless you have very strong edges, then that doesn't count. So that's the so-called total variation term, uh, which basically makes sure that your image is nicely regularized. And then you have here a term that basically tries to bind the output image to the input image. Of course, you don't want a flat output image which would, would, would be completely flat and well regularized, you still want to have some resemblance to the input image. And uh, this is just done with here, uh, with a difference term, you take the input image and the output image, and let's say here, 
the uh, quadrature of the difference uh, and the integral over it should be minimized. But depending on what kind of noise you have, uh, you have different terms here. For example, this is good for Gaussian noise. If you have Laplacian noise, you would like to minimize this term. If you have Poisson noise, it's this term, and so forth. Um, and uh, depending on what you have, you can then apply in Mathematica uh, these total variation filters. And uh, maybe I have to, in the previous case at least, uh, take one example. Let's take this example, the Gaussian example. Uh, so this is a Gaussian noise. This is how the Gaussian noise looks like. You have a close-up. And if I'd like to get rid of the Gaussian noise, I would then apply a total variation filter here. And uh, uh, this would now try to uh, get rid of the noise. And then you can specify also lambda. Lambda uh, tells you how much you'd like to regularize or how much you'd try to adhere to the original version. And by changing that, you can try to find the optimal setting to come up with the best possible image uh, of your photography or whatever. Okay, um, then uh, total variation, this very idea also translates to other uh, features in image processing like in painting. In painting you also have the same uh, functional at hand, but there you have an extra term, a kind of a mask function or mask image, M, which basically you put in here and wherever M is one, this term becomes zero and then you don't care about the difference here anymore. Otherwise, if it's zero, the difference is taken into account. So wherever I have now one, here for example where the scratch is in that image, I don't care about uh, the connection between the output image and the input image, everywhere else I do. And if that is being applied via the method of total variation, I can fix that image very nicely and get Lincoln without a scratch. So uh, this is one other application of this total variation concept. Um, it also applies to convolution, by the way, or deconvolution, sorry. If, so uh, if you have been to my talk yesterday, this is the very same example. Again, you have a functional, but here now uh, the output image should be the input image, but the output image uh, you basically convolve with a kernel that you assume has been uh, applied to the image previously. So the blurred image of the blur of the output image should be the same as the input image. And if that's the same, then basically U is the unblurred or uh, uh, deblurred version. So if this total variation works, you basically de-blur uh, uh, your image. And we can quickly see how well that works. I take the initial uh, Snell chart. I convolve, with, convolve it with a Gaussian kernel like this here with the radius 8. And this would be pretty poor vision. You only get down, let's say, to row number 3 or 4. And then uh, your vision goes down the drain. You don't see anything anymore. But uh, interestingly enough, the whole information is still in the image. It's hidden in the very fine uh, specification of grayscale values per pixel. And uh, via deconvolution, I can get all of this back. And this is the result. So you can even read here the fine print on the left-hand side, uh, so, which is quite amazing. But it's also a little bit too good to be true. Um, and uh, the reality is slightly different. Uh, usually, you don't get this artif artificial great blurred image. But uh, you, you have two things or three things you don't know. First is you don't have infinite precision in grayscale, uh, like I had because it was floating point encoded image with a perfect uh, specification of the grayscale. That's number one because everything you get in is usually just uh, encoded in bytes. So you have an automatic clipping there. Uh, in precision, then uh, you usually have noise in the image. And last but not least, you do not know your uh, a convolution kernel. Uh, and that then makes things a little bit harder. So just clipping, for example, the precision in grayscale gives you here a uh, somewhat more realistic result, which is still OK. I mean, uh, uh, you, you do gain a little bit, but a factor two resolution via deconvolution. All right, uh, so much for filtering. Um, and now I go to the uh, realm of yeah, segmentation. Well, the term total variation comes from this very first. This is basically a functional. Basically, it's an operation that takes in a function and spits out a number. Uh, and the total variation, the terminology comes from this first term, which basically says I'd like to minimize the variation in the image, the total variation, which basically means this image, the resulting image, should be smooth. Uh, because this uh, basically, uh, well, if I go 
back even further. I had a specific. Is it, is it pixel values or just variables, pixel values? Or no, the, the derivative here. Uh, that's, that's the terminology. This oh, okay. total variation term basically is nothing else but first applying a, a differential to the image. And the variation of the differential, that's minimized. That's why it's called total variation. That's, uh, I, I skipped that. I have to admit it was a, sorry for that. Um, OK, so back to uh, segmentation. So that's now the, uh, one of the big issues in image processing. Uh, I think two years ago, I was at a conference. And then people asked or were musing about what will be image processing like in 20 years from now. And they were all giving great predictions. Ah, oh, we do do this and this and this. And then somebody stood up and said, "Let's face it. The last 20 years we have done registration and segmentation, and 20 years we'll st still deal with that problem." It may not be true, but segmentation is a big deal in image processing, nevertheless, and it probably sticks uh, to us for quite some time. Uh, so I just introduced now uh, a small collection of uh, tools in Mathematica that uh, uh, help you to uh, segment issues or uh, segment parts in an image. Um, I'd start with very simple thresholding, uh, which is probably the simplest uh, segmentation uh, process out there. And I'll start with an image, which you typically get if you scan text. If you scan text, usually you get uh, a scan like this. It's not, not always nicely the same brightness. And uh, if you would just binarize that to get the text, you do OK in some area and you fail in some other area. So this is a typical case of stuff you encounter, so binarization or thresholding doesn't work. Then the next uh, step would be to do local adaptive binarize in Mathematica, which allows you to uh, basically adjust the threshold as you go to darker areas. And you see here, as a result, you get a much nicer uh, threshold, um, uh, also in the dark area, and you get a much better segmentation. And that segmentation is nothing, nothing else but thresholding and the thresholding uh, parameters being adapted to the overall um, grayscale or uh, brightness in a certain area. So the area of, that you're looking at here basically says I'm looking at a radius of 40, and if that gets darker in total, I adjust accordingly. And then, of course, you can take that result and pre-process uh, that further, like in text recognize, which would allow you in Mathematica then to translate scanned text into readable text, ASCII code. Uh, another little mentioning about thresholding or binarization is uh, what we call uh, morphological binarize. The idea is as follows. You scan an image, uh, or you generate your edges, and you try to now to binarize the whole thing. And the way it's done for morphological binarize is you basically do a, a binarization with two different thresholds, one low threshold and one high threshold. And the high threshold only picks up the really important uh, features, like here on the right-hand side, whereas the uh, low threshold uh, takes up the uh, fine and more subtle detail. And then what uh, morphological binarize does, it basically starts off on these uh, features, on the important features, and then just takes all the white pixels that are connected to these pixels as a result. So it's a kind of hysteresis. You just make sure that uh, uh, you only uh, get uh, objects that have a really bright pixel in them, but uh, you also extend to uh, less bright pixels, and then the output would be like this. Some kind of thresholding that, in many cases, I assume would be uh, beneficial for you to know. All right, next segmentation. So um, this was uh, one example where you just segment looking at one pixel at a time. And this is another example where you just look one, at one pixel at a time, but you do a kind of basically clustering in the uh, color space. So basically, the space of values of the pixels makes up a, a feature space. If you have color, it's, it tends to be three-dimensional, could be any n-dimensional. And then the clustering segmentation basically tries to find clusters in that space. And then according to what cluster a certain pixel adheres to, it gets a certain uh, component index. Um, so again, there's no vicinity that I take to into account, and therefore, uh, segmentation quite often makes sense to combine certain techniques. For example, here's a technique, again, a filter that I didn't mention yet, uh, uh, that uh, tries to equilibrate neighboring colors, uh, but tries not to diffuse or blur edges at a certain strength. And that's basically the pronormalic filter. It's uh, kind of a diffusion equation that I apply on the image, but the diffusion coefficient, CK, depends on the gradient. And if the gradient gets too strong, the diffusion is basically shut down by making CK very small. 
uh, otherwise the diffusion is strong or the blurring is strong, and then uh, specifying basically the, uh, how often or how much you blur and uh, the threshold by which you basically try to stop blurring. You can use here Perona Malik to blur the image without blurring the edges. And once I've done that, I can basically apply now, uh, for example, chromaticity plot on that particular image. And I see here now the color space, how the pixels are distributed. And then I can ask, given on that distribution of pixels, what kind of clustered, clusters would clustering components uh, come up with? And it comes up here if I'm asking for six clusters with the following segmentation of the image. So it gets an idea of the eyeball. Muscles are somewhat, muscle tissue is somewhat well uh, um, identified, fat tissue as well. It, it can be better. It's, it's not an optimal case, but uh, I think you get the idea. So this was all co uh, color-based or pixel-based segmentation, and now I come to region-based segmentations. So where uh, connectivity and neighborhood of pixel does play a role. And the simplest or uh, easiest to understand uh, case is region growing. Uh, in Mathematica, it's called, uh, what is it called? Region binarize, sorry. So uh, typical scenario in the hospital, you have a, an, a, a scan here, a tomography, x-ray tomography of uh, sagittal one of the uh, human skull. You have the brain and you unfortunately have here a large tumor in the brain and then uh, in order to identify the size and uh, where you probably have to cut and so forth, you try to segment the tumor. And of course, just doing that based on the pixel value would be a bad idea because then you may segment part of the eyes and so forth. So you have to build on the connectivity. What you do is you basically place a seed exactly at this position, either by playing a mask here or by reading out uh, the, uh, oops, oh, I'm now in display mode, I can't do that. But I can select here a position if I want to, if I'm in regular working mode. And uh, then I just run region binarize on this based on these seeds and values. Let me quickly get this. And that gives you a segmentation like this. Or you can, well, as I said, you don't have to have a mask. You can also just take a coordinate. You get the segmentation. And then you can use, for example, highlight image to visualize the uh, segmentation that you obtain. And uh, in this particular case, uh, I do a, a fairly good job, I guess. All right, uh, more segmentation stuff. Um, another um, method that is somewhat similar to region growing is uh, watershed. But there, watershed works somewhat differently. Here again, a medical application. I have here uh, a sagittal slice of the heart, the two heart chambers, which are pretty bright. And I'd like to segment those. Now, the first, again, would be to get some seeds. And uh, well, you can do that by hand, or you can automate this. In this case, for example, I just uh, blur the image very strongly and then look at peaks, bright peaks, and usually here, since the uh, chambers come up uh, pretty bright, I get a peak for every chamber. And uh, this is exactly what I got here, a seed here for that chamber, a seed for that chamber, and one outside. And then what I do is the following. I basically view the image as a kind of a mountain range, like this here. This is just a visualization of what I want to uh, get to. So it's like a mountain range, and just like landscape, you have water basins in that landscape, and those water basins make up quite often very nice uh, um, segmentation uh, prior. Uh, uh, so if you, for example, try to identify the water basins where uh, the water runs to that point, then uh, basically taking the gradient of the image gives you the kind of mountain range, and then you just let the watershed algorithm identify those water basins, and uh, that will allow you to basically come up with a pretty good uh, segmentation because every heart chamber basically is, is, is its own water basin in this particular case. And you can do that, of course, by the way, what I do now in 2D, you can do in 3D as well and so forth. And uh, sometimes, and I uh, probably have shown you this example quite often, you can apply these ideas to very uh, unusual cases. For example, if you have a maze like this one here, then the solution path is like the mountain ridge that departs the left and the right side of the maze. So by just running on that particular maze, the watershed algorithm, I get the solution path uh, uh, right away. So it's, uh, you can use whatever I'm saying here, the point I'd like to make is whatever you do with the image processing commands, you can quite often also apply to other problems. Uh, you don't have to do it to images or intrinsically to images. Uh, another segmentation here would be Chanvese binarize. This again is one, uh, is one that's based on a functional, where the functional looks like this here. You try to 
basically come up with a region in the image D, or partition the, uh, the, the range or the domain of an image omega into region D and uh, D uh, uh, complement omega. Uh, so that this functional gets as, uh, as small as possible. They can basically have different priors. You can try to make the boundary as short as possible. You can try to minimize or maximize the area, or you can try to minimize or maximize the difference between the foreground and the background to a certain color. Uh, and uh, so you can here, for example, say the foreground should be uh, red, the background should be blue, and then it tries to find an optimal functional and thereby tries to do a segmentation, which works, as you can see, fairly well. Or with a manipulate, I can play with some of the parameters in the functional and thereby, for example, try to get as much land mass as possible or by uh, even flipping foreground and background and so forth. So, uh, well, I don't go into detail here, I have to admit, but uh, just giving you an idea. Um, quickly, since I'm running low on time, I have to hurry up a little bit. Grow cut segmentation is a very uh, modern and uh, very nice um, segmentation technique that can help you to do even very hard uh, segmentation uh, 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 problems. Well, this one is pretty hard because the foreground and background are very much alike, and the way it works is that basically, the graph cut algorithm basically assumes kind of a graph network between all the pixels, and you basically give a starting point for the background, uh, for the background which I'm, uh, I cannot do that in the, no, no, I can. Uh, okay, there's one problem, I think, with the magnification factor. I have to change that quickly. Oh yeah, now it works. Um, so I specify here the background with red dots. Uh, I do the foreground with green dots, and then I run the grow cut, and then you see it gives you, uh, well, depending on how you set your seeds, a good or not so great uh, segmentation. But that's usually a very nice uh, uh, segmentation technique that once you have a rough segmentation, you run this on top of it to get a fine segmentation. That works very well. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll skip this here. This is a nice example of a typical segmentation technique where you first try to create features, then run machine learning for a segmentation or a classifier, and then apply the classifier to obtain a, um, uh, a segmentation. So I now skip just due to the lack of time, and since this is just kind of a teaser for a tutorial, uh, I quickly skip to the, almost to the end to come to the last problem of image processing, which is registration. Uh, as I mentioned already here, you have typically two images. Uh, now this is a somewhat more difficult uh, uh, approach because you have two images uh, uh, generated with two different modalities. One was an X-ray scan or X-ray tomography. The other one was a PET scan, positive, positive, uh, positron emission tomography scan. And you try to get them congruently on top of each other uh, simply because uh, on the MRI scan you can see very nicely is that uh, uh, the, the patient features on the other side, you have a very low resolution, but you can see where uh, uh, functionality is taking place, and you try to match those. And uh, there's one way to do it in a dense registration. That means you basically move the image constantly on top of each other and see what the distance is between the two images. And there are different measures for distance images. You can have a kind of a, a Euclidean distance where you just uh, calculate the difference per pixels. But in this case, we have what's called a mutual, uh, mutual entropy difference uh, between the images, so they don't have to be the same modality. And that gives you a function that specifies for different uh, uh, transformation parameters uh, the distance between the two images. And whenever the distance is minimal, then you have a good fit. And that's basically here what you can see. I move the distance, uh, the PET scan on top of the X-ray. I calculate the distance, and I got this as a mutual normalized entropy and it seems to be minimal here at minus 0.04, which basically I also can automatically find with find minimum. Apply find minimum to the transformation and then do an overlay to see if I've done a good job and yes, uh, it fits nicely on top of each other. And well, if you're not in medicine but are, have a less mundane problems at hand, you have taken two pictures, then maybe sparse registration would be uh, your cup of tea. Uh, here I have two images taken at the lakefront in Chicago, and uh, what the uh, algorithm uh, here at hand is, is as follows. You try to find feature points, so very uh, 
well-defined points in an image that you would also then find again in another image. First you, well, look for these feature points in one image on the left and then on the right, and then you compare all these uh, feature points that you found and uh, come up with corresponding points. And once you have the corresponding points, you basically get here with image corresponding points a set of points in the left image and one in the set of points in the right image. And then in the next step, you have to find a transformation that brings all these points on top of each other, which you, by the, by the way, get, uh, well, these are the points in the two images. And this is find geometric transformation that finds the transformation to get from one side to the other. And this is then applying it to the image and uh, you can see that you can do what's called stitching here. You can uh, generate a panorama uh, view and uh, superimpose these images. Of course, you can do it a bit better than this. This is just for demonstration purposes that you see the two different images still at hand. All right, this would uh, conclude my very quick kind of teaser tour uh, into image processing. And uh, uh, well, just kind of a, a little hint to go where to go from here. As I mentioned up front, we will have a, a one-day workshop on image processing organized by the reseller in uh, the Benelux countries by Dick Verkerk uh, from Kandinsten, which is going to be on the 17th and 18th of June in Amsterdam. So then this whole thing will be extended to eight hours. Uh, there will be a, a webinar, on de well, there are webinars on demand in, uh, on, the, uh, on the Wolfram, web search, uh, sorry, on the Wolfram uh, uh, website. And then there will be a, a, a specific event, a so-called virtual workshop on image processing on the 23rd of June. And I have set a link to that here. Uh, then there are the Mathematica uh, marketing examples that uh, come with the code. And these are very nice examples to get going. And the same holds true for Mathematica demonstration projects on image processing. Also a very nice source of initial code that you may want to have a look at to get started. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope I have gotten you some ideas. <laughs>